so many of the sounds I recorded outside in Norway are like this. They're the whistling, rustling, distorted sounds that wind makes when it touches your microphone. It isn't great, which is why I'm not playing that much of it for you. But wind is a character in this series. It signals bad fishing weather. And this being a podcast about fish and seafood, well, I knew that windy, wintry days wouldn't bode very well for us. It's 6 a.m. and it's our first morning in Varda, the easternmost point in Norway. Um, but yes, folks do go out here fishing year round under very, very, very cold conditions. But I trust, I trust fishers when they tell you that it's too windy. To go out, it ends up being wasteful. They don't catch anything, and you know, it could be dangerous. So we won't go fishing after all. I recorded this in my hotel room in Varda, over in eastern Norway. You can't hear behind me, but the wind is shaking the window panes as I look outside. It's definitely not a good day for fishing. You're listening to The Catch a podcast from foreign policy about the seafood we eat and the impact it can have on our world. I'm Ruxandra Draguidi. Today, episode five, Holding the Line. You could say that fishing in Norway is as good as it gets. Their Arctic waters are very productive. The fishing quotas here are respected. Fishers and policymakers follow the science, and there's this long-running cooperation between Norway and Russia, and yet making sure that fish stocks are healthy and that fishers can keep on making a living from them is no simple task. Fisheries are so complicated. So what does politics have to do with it? As it turns out, fishers have to be just as aware about political winds as they do bad weather. So that, this is, the, you know, so, so you see the stacks? It's a typical snow crab stack. Yeah. I'm with my reporting partner, Eskild Johansson, yeah. on a wharf where the big fishing trawlers land their catch. And he's showing me these big baskets with round metal frames, about 20 or 30 inches wide, woven with rope. They're crab pots, piled one on top of the other and rising as high as two-story buildings. When fishers head out to the northeastern Barents Sea, almost at the maritime border with Russia, to catch snow crab, they throw hundreds of these baskets onto the seabed. Those sink to the bottom, where the snow crab crawl in. After about a week, the baskets are retrieved and hauled back up. So imagine being on board of one of these boats, like me, and you have all this, you're going in a tunnel of this, and then a storm. So they're weighing back and forth. And that's what hit you? Now Eskild is telling me how some months ago, he went snow crab fishing with a crew. Needless to say, it was very windy. Uh, and uh, because it came crashing down, so I could just see these guys climbing everywhere, trying to get off the, from the... It was really dangerous. It's super dangerous work. So my job was to line them up, so you will have, you know, have guys going here, standing here, standing here, passing me the pods, so I will make a train out of them. This is to set them again. And then there's a big, very heavy... Uh, overboard. Low, overboard. <laughs> So it, was, so it went out one by one, really fast, trying not to get entangled into this. At one point, a big wave hit the side of the ship and threw everyone overboard. Eskild landed on a crane, face and shoulder first. Today he has this half-inch scar right above his left eye. I am terrified as I'm listening to Eskild's story. He says a crew member on a nearby vessel, a man from Latvia, fell into the frigid waters when he was trying to haul the baskets full of crab back up on the deck. What? He did that? Yeah. He drowned? Yeah. Oh, my God. So it's one of the most dangerous jobs. And I realized that standing there, so I don't, I don't want to do it anymore. You know? Oh, my God. I, I remember, no, you know, I didn't realize someone actually went overboard and Oh, yeah, they it, they did, yeah. Uh, and I remember I was doing this, you know, making this and trying to push them. And we had two guys in front of me. And then a wave came in on the back port. And I could see these guys falling over and being sucked out towards the port. But they both managed to just reach into some rope and stuff. And so it was always this sort of yeah. danger. That man's crewmates couldn't get to him, nor could a rescue vessel. 
The Coast Guard came and pulled up the entire chain of pots, which that man had helped to set, but they never found him. The water was too cold. He probably died from hypothermia in a matter of minutes. We're not going near there. Hmm? We're not going that far out. Are we or are no. we are? Snow crab is that's a large vessel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, you wouldn't go out that far with a small vessel with no. a small vessel, right. Needless to say, I am pretty relieved that the fishers we're about to meet up with decided it's too windy to go out today. So this podcast may be about cod, but I've also told you about salmon, particularly farmed salmon, and now crab. There are two species that thrive in these waters, snow crab and king crab. Now, in the early days of winter, crab rules. It also fetches the most money. Fishers in northern Norway can make as much as $20 per pound of snow crab and $60 per pound of king crab. That's 10 times more than they can make by catching cod. Even though we won't go out fishing today, we're still meeting up with Willie Peterson. You heard him in episode one. He showed us his boat. It's a nice boat. The same boat we would have gone out in today to look for king crab. The vessel feels sturdy at about 40 feet long. These boats can cost upwards of $1 million. That's a huge investment for a small town family here in the north. You may remember that Willie took us inside the cabin, offered us coffee, and told us how fishing was in his blood how he studied sociology and wrote his thesis on fisheries management. But even out here, basic business laws still apply. The bigger you are, the better things are for you. You know, the policies always change somewhere, ensuring that the bigger one got more quotas, the bigger one got more capital, the bigger one got more power inside the fisheries management. Um, this course just continued and continues and continues. Still today. Willie is from Batsa, in the northern county of Finnmark, on the western edge of the Barents Sea. This whole region is synonymous with fishing. This may be the Arctic, yet the Barents Sea remains ice-free year-round due to the warm North Atlantic drift. Willie tells us that the fisheries cooperation between Norway and Russia has benefited everyone. But when it comes to quotas how much catch there should be year after year after year, Willie believes that the people of Finnmark should have a greater say than the central government in Oslo. I'm pro-local management, you know. But since the cod stock, the immigrates, they run through international waters and all those, so, so you have to have state-level quotas. And management quotas. And management quotas. But still, you have... You have those systems in other countries, but in Norway, it's all state management. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you should say, okay, the Finnmark's part of the total quota should be that much mm-hmm. cut. Mm-hmm. And it should be up to the locals to harvest on their part of it, you know, yeah. and manage it the way that they want, you know. Mm-hmm. And that would probably mean that the big boats that fish in Finnmark but deliver all their fish to China, you say, no, you can't fish here. You can't fish in this area that caught because you may do so, but if you fish it, you have to deliver it to Finnmark and make the uh, make the value of that fish stay in Finnmark mm-hmm. because we need the value of that fish to do investments uh, uh, to make sure that uh, young people can buy a boat and live on this mm-hmm. tradition. What Willie's saying here reminds me of what we heard on episode three from Varda, the town that's just two hours away from here. There, we heard that natural resources should belong to the people. Willie sees the fish stocks as a shared resource that should be treated as such. For instance, if you happen to have a bigger fishing boat, you shouldn't automatically qualify for a bigger quota. On a very good year, he says, Willie could catch 120 tons. That's 240,000 pounds. These days, they're catching more like 50 tons a year. Well, I think we like 
to see ourselves as people that care about ecosystems we care about the stocks you know and 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 we try not to fish more uh, we, we, we try not fish too much you know destroying this wealth we always had enough money uh, to, to buy groceries or whatever and, and and saying that, you know, they're thinking about you don't fish too much. You fish when the fish is here, and and, and we fished what the boats could bear, you know. And the boats has always been so small that we, you can't eradicate the fish uh, cod stocks with this type of boats, you know. And we like to think that we had a type of cultural fishers management that was sustainable for the different stocks here. Uh, but when that culture changes, to maximize profits, you know, you, you don't talk about uh, fishing stocks, you fish and talk about your share stocks, you know. <laughs> and when you change that um, way of thinking, that culture, you know, you end up with your question being more and more um, when all the other guys, mm -hmm. you know, fish to maximize profits. Mm -hmm. Why don't you guys do it? Just down the road from the wharf where we meet Willie, we find his father, Arne. Arne is in his late 70s. He's got white hair and piercing blue eyes like his son. Like everyone else we meet, he greets us with fresh coffee. It's easily my fourth cup of the day. Arne has been politically active in Finnmark County his whole life. He's an engineer and has been a fisherman and a fishers union leader for decades. I mean, I would love to find out how you learned to fish when you started. Take me to the very beginning. Yeah, at the beginning, that was, you no, the first time I went to fish was with my father. Started with his dad, yeah. Yeah. So he fished with his father in a boat called the right outside here on the fjord, and the boat was called Tornado. Mm, when he mm. was 15 years old. It started yeah. when he was 15 years okay. old. His father. Uh -huh. yeah. And clearly, Arne passed on his love of fishing to his only son, Willy. They've been fishing together for about 15 years, but when he turns 75 years old next year, Arne will have to pass on his fishing quotas to Willy. That's how it works in Norway. The amount you're allowed to fish is dependent on the size of your boat, and the Petersons can catch 50,000 kilos of cod or 2,000 kilos of king crab a year. Next year, that quota will be on Willy's name alone. Arne described for us in Norwegian how this inheritance would work for his son, Eskild interpreted. So now they have to start to transfer us, you know, of the ownership of the company, because when he gets to this and this age, next year sometime, then, yeah. then he's, he will not be eligible to, to own this quota uh, in that sort of uh, coastal fishing group that they, uh, they are in. So but I understand. I can't that. Very open. But but he can be a fisherman together with his son. Yeah. So. But I understand that process of transferring the quota is very complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It shouldn't yeah. be that way, huh? No. No, I did you in po en did you in po po politiken or or kar kar skal være grundlaget for folk her. The reason why this is difficult with the transition of the quotas between generations is because somebody decided that the, the right to fish uh, in these fjords should be a commercial right that you can sell and buy. Yeah. So the reason why uh, it's going to be a difficult task to make sure that uh, Willi's son can take over the, uh, the right from his father is because it's been commercialized. After yet another cup of coffee, we finish our interview. We say goodbye and head back into the wind. Thank you. Great to meet you. Thank you. The current craze for catching crab, both snow and king, is bringing big bucks to this fishing fleet. But it may also be distorting Ardne and Willie's traditional, more sustainable fishing culture. Snow crab, the smallest of the two, can sell for about $30 a pound. King crab, which, like snow crab, is an invasive species, looks like an alien from another planet, and it can go for $100 a pound. 
Invasive species can destroy ecosystems, and they can be profitable. In the case of king crab, its introduction to Norway was actually quite intentional. In the 1960s, Soviet scientists released nine red king crabs that came from Russia's Far East and the Sea of Japan into the Barents Sea. They soon spread west into Norwegian waters. The population exploded, if I understand correctly. And so, we need also to ask ourselves, how did that happen? This is Konstantin Drevetniak, a former scientist and the head of the Union of Fishing Companies in the northeast of Russia. Each fisherman is also an entrepreneur. It's his own business. So the task, to put it bluntly, is to make a profit. And so, if you have too little quotas, right? It's bad. It's not great. But the other extreme is having too much. It's not good either. Because then the prices collapses and you work more and make less money. He says the abundance of crab in the Barents Sea has been a boon for both the Russian and Norwegian fishing economies. But making sure these resources, whether cod or crab, are sustainably harvested comes down to the work of scientists. We're talking about an ecosystem here, and we need to understand the ecosystem of the Barents Sea. So it's not like suddenly we are going to have tuna or swordfish or any other kind of exotic fish all of a sudden. It's more about within this ecosystem we are going to have a different amount of fish some getting bigger and some smaller. But as water temperatures rise, there's like an optimal temperature for the cod and its growth. And then, when that temperature goes down, there's also a period where that's optimal, where the amount of cod is increasing. So in my opinion, in the next two or three years, it's going to be a bigger amount. It's complicated. A lot of scientists disagree about how much cod as a species could change due to rising temperatures. With fishing, there are good years and there are bad years. And currently, Norwegian scientists are suggesting that king crab quotas should be cut by 60 percent and that cod quotas are cut by 20 percent for next year. So far, 2024 could be the year when fishers like Willy Peterson in Vatsa or Svein Harald Holm in Varda see their earnings drop. The two hope that this will only be temporary. They trust the cooperation between Russia and Norway to determine fishing quotas. Call it a marriage of convenience or of mutual interests, but the fact remains that there's too much at stake not to engage. This sentiment was echoed by Norebo Chief Sustainability Officer Sergei Senikov. Norebo is one of Russia's top fishing companies. So we are sort of living in a, in a living world. I mean, we can't say that we are sort of living in a political vacuum and nothing can affect our activities. That's not correct, definitely. But we are trying to continue what we do. My personal view that this cooperation will be very crucial in terms of the uh, existence, not only the, the industries of two countries, but it has a lot with the social, the local communities. There's lots of people depend on the existence of those fisheries. And so therefore, it's good that we take care of the stocks and the fisheries uh, as much as we can. But when it comes to Russia's invasion into Ukraine, and how that's affecting the cooperation. Well, Sergei's not really saying. He's not really able to. He needs to stay out of politics. Well, our feeling from the fishing industry that we are out of politics. The task of the fisherman is, is to get fish, to produce food for people, and we know that the demand for food in the world is growing, and especially when it comes to the food with high protein. And, you know, fish is an excellent source of protein. Most importantly, neither Sergei nor Konstantin see the core agreement between Russia and Norway as under threat. Well, the one thing in terms of the uh, setting our catch, we rely on the well-established and recognized methods and the scientists in both countries. 
this uh, scientific cooperation has been a, a very good success uh, from in many years from the Soviet time, and I don't see any reason why it shall stop uh, today. I mean, uh, it's a vital element in the. Uh, Management of the stock. Должны понимать, да, мы говорим про 1976 год, когда, скажем так... So what I like about this agreement is that it doesn't really get influenced by politics much. The quotas, they are based on science and they don't fluctuate with the current politics of the time. So we need to save the fish for the future generations and keep the scientific basis of this agreement. Next time on The Catch... Is the Norwegian and Russian cod cooperation still the poster fish for global fisheries management? Or will geopolitical forces finally become too big to overcome? We conclude our season three with a look at Svalbard, deeper into the Arctic zone, where cod may help us avoid conflicts altogether. Uh, I want to point Fish are calling us to diplomacy from the depths of the sea, saying, please, I can feed you and give you enough food for the table, but you need to make it sustainable. That's next week on The Catch. This is it. Episode 5 of The Catch is done. Our last episode from Norway will be out next week. Our show is a production of Foreign Policy in partnership with the Walton Family Foundation. Our production team includes Rosie Julin, Rob Sachs, and Evan Munoz. Special thanks to my co-reporter, Eskil Johansson, and also thanks to our translator, Anton Loboda. If you like what you're hearing, please consider leaving a review and subscribe on Apple or wherever you get your podcasts, or head over to foreignpolicy.com where you can listen to our other podcasts and sign up for our newsletter. Thanks for listening. I'm Ruxandra Guidi, and I'll see you next week.